Amen, amen, amen. Well, this is Pastor Andre Martin, the Divine Truth Christian Center, where God wants your dreams and visions realized. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We honor you, Lord God. We thank you for allowing for us to be able to come into your presence one more time, Heavenly Father. I pray, Heavenly Father, right now in the name of Jesus, that as we go forward in the word tonight, Lord God, that you will bring clarity and understanding not only to those that are um, within the sanctuary, but also those that may be watching online right now. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Tonight, we will be starting a new series of dealing with the Creed, more specifically known as the Apostles' Creed. Um, this particular teaching is not a new thing. It's actually a very ancient thing. It actually comes from a time um, around the 5th century, um, which is during the early church years. And um, these particular, or this particular creed is an ecumenical way of expressing what the church believes and why, or what does a Christian believe and why. And so the 12 apostles, which you know are the disciples of Jesus Christ, they all focused on specific tenets of the faith. Um, the very first being, I believe, I believe. And so, um, one of the things that I want to read to you is the Apostles' Creed. Now, once again, when we're thinking about Apostle Creed, you might be thinking of <laughs> Rocky. And remember, Apostle Creed, oh, it was called Apollo Creed. So that's like a little play on words. But this is the Apostles' Creed for everybody in the neighborhood. So I'm talking about the Apostles' Creed, the 12, the 12 disciples. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, he taught them um, specific things about the faith. And as a result of that, he was able to um, um, impart into them, impart with knowledge and willage, I mean, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, um, spiritual meaning on a very, very deep level, so deep until they were willing to die for it. And not only were they willing to die for it, but also their um, successors died for it. When you think about Arrhenius and Polycarp, and these were disciples of the Apostle John and, and individuals. Um, uh, of that nature, these particular people, all the way up to the Nicene Council, all of these bishops from everywhere, many of them, even um, 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 when they came together um, to, to talk about the doctrines of, of the faith, many of them have, were, were, had, had gone through serious, serious persecution. It wasn't just like, hey, we're going to start a church, and then all the persecution ended once Paul um, um, uh, was converted. Persecution continued after that particular portion because they were to disciple nations and every nation was not welcome to the gospel. And so this Apostle Creed is one of the main elements that they took with them as they began to evangelize different particular peoples and nations once they left from that particular region of the Middle East. And so the Apostle Creed, once again, which was coined in the 5th century from the Orthodox standpoint is this, and it says this, it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, or the alive and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, mm -hmm. the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, as a quick little disclaimer for all of our, um, our viewers and our listeners, one of the key things that I mentioned was that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. There's two Catholic Church. There is Big C and then there's Little C. Okay. The Holy Catholic Church, Big C, is the universal church. That's what is translated as universal church. In other words, we believe in the universal body of Christ. That is what Catholic means. And then there's the Little C Catholic Church, which is Roman Catholicism which is a new thing. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the body of Christ, see, when you look at the word Catholic, Catholic in the Greek basically means universal church. Mm -hmm. 
So there's big C Catholic and little c Catholic. There's the religious Catholic with the Pope, Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, um, Roman Catholicism, indulgences, ro rosary beads. That's the Roman Catholic Church. Notice how I put Roman Catholic Church. That is different from the Catholic Church, which is nothing more than the universal body of Christ, simply meaning that as a Christian in the Western Hemisphere, I believe in Jesus Christ. If I were to go to Africa or Portugal, those same Christians that I meet over there, although may, they may speak a different language, they may come from a different place, they still believe in the same Jesus Christ. You know another word for Catholic in its proper meaning? The body of Christ. Okay, so that's what I am referring to when you hear the word Catholic, big C. Catholic, little c, is more of a religious sect that belongs to Christendom. When I say Christendom, it is, the, it is what people view as everybody who has something to do with Jesus Christ. But not everybody that has something to do with Jesus Christ believes all these things. Okay. This Apostles' Creed is what the Apostles taught um, through their teachings inside of the Gospel as far as what Jesus wanted everybody in the world to know. All right. So that's good for you to know the difference between Catholic Big C and Catholic Little C. Catholic Big C is the body of Christ, the universal church. When you get saved in America, and when Jesus comes back, people in America are not the only ones who are going to be saved. You're going to see streams of people coming up from out of graves, from all. There will be many nations and many tongues. There will be many nations. There will be many people, not just one group of people. It will be people from all around the world that you'll see in heaven. That is the Catholic or the universal church that I am speaking of, not the Roman Catholic Church, Constantine, the Nicene Council of Bishops and all those different types of things, that's different. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I, need, I think I need clarification. Okay. Because you're saying the big C is the universal, the universal church. But the little C is the Roman Catholic. Yes. But in the Apostles' Creed, it's the little C. Mm -hmm. That's a font. Yes, that's just the font. Okay, well, that's why the teacher brings clarity. So, so if I need so to... If, if, okay, so for our understanding, would it be Holy Catholic versus Roman Catholic? Yes. Can we say those two? Yes. Is that a big C, little C? Yes, because as you can see right here, the, the H is lowercase. Okay. But for everybody that's watching, everybody in the room, there's a difference between editing and formatting mm -hmm. and the teaching or the principle, the truth behind the principle. Focus on the truth of the principle versus the formatting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So because the differences is not in the slide, the differences is coming from up here and the knowledge that I had. Because sometimes they call it the Holy See. That's why you can't just make it straightforward like that. Sometimes, and that, and and, but at, that's actually a good question because, to a lot of sinners, and and and, I'm going to finish the rest of my sentence. But since we hung up on that, we're just going to go ahead and just sit park right there just for a second. Because to the world, people don't see Roman Catholicism any different from Protestant Christianity. When they see the Roman Catholicism, they actually lump all believers into that one thing mm -hmm. because they see that church worldwide mm -hmm. everywhere the mm -hmm. Vatican that's what they're thinking of and even some Christians believe that Catholics are Christians but Catholics will tell you that they are not Christians mm -hmm. in the sense of the reformers of 500 years Martin Luther the 95 thesis and 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 in that particular tradition so if we if we were to put our church which is a non non denominational church in the category we were reformed Protestant church or Protestant church, okay? But it, for the purposes of understanding this particular slide, everybody, the uppercase C and lowercase C is actually inconsequential. For me to tell you from a teaching standpoint, the uppercase C or the Holy Catholic Church, I'm talking about the universal church. I do not have any significance with the denomination, so therefore I put it as a lowercase C. Okay. 
the slide and what I'm saying is inconsequential with each other, so don't get hung up on that. But I can edit it just so, you know, just for mm -hmm. that purpose is for people who are looking, you know, at it in a different way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. So, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, once again, the purpose of this slide, there's different fonts and things of that nature, but don't look at the font, look at the truth behind the font, all right? Because everything is lowercase inside of this particular thing, except for a couple of different areas, all right? So, once again, the piece that we're going to focus on is I believe. Let's just start there, okay? So, Rabbi Zacharias, which is a great theologian, and, and, I, and, and when I started teaching things dealing with what you believe and why back in 2014, I will admit I didn't really know the vast amount of information that is out there like I do now um, with all the studies I've been doing and reading books and things of that nature. So this man is like a titan in regards to apologetics and as far as just learning about our faith as a whole. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like to focus on these things is because one of the things that kind of prompted me to kind of start with this particular series is that um, I was talking with my sons and um, also reading some things online about um, Christians who grow up in church but then end up not being saved. One particular young lady, when I was looking at a string of posts, one of the things that she said was, and because uh, said was, is that I have been in the church for 27 years, and now I see the light. I no longer um, believe in all of the things, but I am I know everything there is to know about church because I was in church for all those years. But the truth of the matter is, is that that individual is actually a fugitive from the faith. They were in the church, but they weren't saved. And so that's one of the main reasons why, like, like when people say, just because you stand inside of a garage doesn't make you a car, okay, or just because you park inside of a garage, or stand inside of a garage, it does not make you a car, um, just because you stand inside of a gym doesn't mean that you're going to have biceps and triceps. We pass by the gym every day, and <laughs> it's just two different things. So just because, this is very important for you, not only here, but those of you watching online, it is very important for you to know that you do not get class credits or continuing education credits uh, for your attendance in church because mom and them brought you there for all of those years. Mm -hmm. You have to believe for yourself because every man has to give an account for themselves. So as Rabbi Zachariah says this, he says, what I believe in my heart must make sense in my mind. Mm -hmm. So as Christians or as followers of the way, okay, Christian is the new term. Christian is something that's easy to identifiable, but we are followers of the way, the way, the truth, the life, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. So God never meant for us to believe in something that did not make sense. Now, we don't always understand everything that he does or everything or all of his ways because as high as the heavens are above the earth or how or, God's, or, or, or the way that God's ways are so drastically uh, different from the way that we conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. He is holy other. Not only is he holy other, H-O-L-Y other, holy, perfect, sinless, all-powerful, omniscient, omna, omna, omnipresent, but he's holy other, W-H-O-L-L-Y. In other words, he's totally different from humans. He's not human at all. Mm -hmm. No one has seen him. But everybody has felt him and has been impacted by his power. So this particular quote right here means a lot. But let me give you another one. And once again, we're talking about I believe. Do you know why you believe? Do you know why you're even a Christian in the first place? You know, where did you purge before you became a Christian? Did somebody say that that was necessary? Now, the reason why this is important is because when you know what you believe and why, it pushes all that religion out. And when you push all that religion out and whatever you think that you um, needed to do prior to um, becoming a Christian, those things were false. God is the one who saves you and brings you to yourself, brings you to himself first. He loved you. It's just like the scripture says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. 
You didn't love me first. I loved you first. And because of my love for you, that drew you to myself. Mm -hmm. I was telling somebody today that sometimes God hooks us when we're very young, but we don't know what that tugging on our heart is. We knew that it was always there, but we were fighting just like the fish inside of the ocean. <laughs> Some fish are bigger than others, just like Paul. Paul was called before he entered into his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. He had the hook inside of him because of the irresistible grace of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But... After a while, it became irresistible, and God says, all right, I'm tired of you trying to run, running, running. You know how it is, running from, the, what you running from the law for? What, running from the law for, that's the hip-hop song. Mm -hmm. but, but you're still on the hook. Mm -hmm. And in today's time, I believe God is going to continue to get folk in the boat. But the way that you get on the hook in the first place, God has already set up, is to um, share the gospel so that people will believe. Amen. You believe that Jesus died and rose again on the third day? Died very rose again on the third day? Yes, I do. Then you say. That's that's Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. That, that's it. That's it. But then when we're in church, we're taught that we have to do a whole bunch of other stuff prior to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you believe in heart, Jesus was risen from the dead, then you will be saved. If you confess it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he was risen from the dead, then you will be saved. That key word, believe, is very important because we have a whole bunch of beliefs, a whole bunch of beliefs. And you'll be surprised to know that there's a lot of people who are in church that have a whole bunch of beliefs. And some of them don't even believe in God, but they're sitting there listening Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And some of us were the same type. And that's why even when I come, came, come to my own children, I don't make them say because I'm a, their um, father and they happen to have a pastor as a father. I don't want my kids to be, quote unquote, preacher's kids. So I told them before and I tell them many times, I don't want you to think that you're saved just because I'm your dad. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want you to grow up being fake Christians. Amen. Amen. If you're going to be one particular way, just respect your mother and I who are saved. And keep it 100 with us. But I don't want you to be fooled into thinking that you're going to heaven just because of my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. God has to call you for yourself. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And if a lot of parents who are Christians did that with their children, then those children would have a different view of the faith on many different levels. Mm -hmm. Amen. Authenticity. So this word believe um, in the Greek pis to well means to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust to entrust oneself to an entity in complete confidence some of us want to believe our elected officials some of us want to believe God I heard somebody that said the other day that I want to believe that there is a God but I can't but I say to, to that particular individual if they were to hear me today there is um that is actually um, very realistic for you to feel that way because you can't believe in God based on your decision making process you can know that there is one you can feel that there's something on the inside but remember the scripture says that God draws all men unto himself whatever has whatever has been placed into the father's hand belongs to me or whatever whatever the father has placed into my hand those will be saved. So God has to bring the person in. Mm -hmm. Jesus, irresistible grace, is the one that um, keeps the men and transforms their lives, along with sanctification. Mm -hmm. Next up. Now, here's, here's one thing about belief, and look at this particular thing. I, I, I was doing my studies today, and I came across this little statistic. In one survey released in the year 2013 by the company Servada, 37% of the 5,886 Americans who were polled said that they believed in the existence of extraterrestrial life or aliens. 37% is a lot of folk. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's almost 350 to 400 million people in the United States. Just take 37% of that. Now, here's what's even more interesting, while 21% said that they didn't believe at all, and 42% were unsure that they're aliens. So you have almost 75% people out there believe that there may be something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's why we keep on going out to space, because some of those scientists yeah. believe mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah. But that's not the kicker. 
The kicker is the next part of the paragraph, which says this, responses varied by religion. 55% of atheists said that they believed in extraterrestrials. Good God Almighty. As did 44% of Muslims, 37% of Jews, and 36% of Hindus, and 32% of Christians. Never seen one before. But the part that really stuck out to me was the atheists. So the atheists believe have a higher chance of believing that there's aliens than they do in God. They would rather give credit to a being from another world as the one that brought us into existence mm -hmm. as a form of a higher power, higher intelligence. That's why you see so many movies on the sci-fi channel mm -hmm. that have aliens coming from outer mm -hmm. space. And now they're coming back to roost on Earth because they created us long ago and we haven't caught up with their evolutionary processes just yet. <laughs> so now they have to destroy us, meet, 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 must destroy the humans. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of their line of thinking comes from. So this statistic lets me know that people will believe anything. Mm -hmm. And as somebody else taught me today, that we're in a fight to, um, to we're in a fight over sheep. Sheep don't know everything. Sheep have to be educated. Sheep are are could be any person out there that is unaware of things, but. But in regards to the gospel, God does not, God wants us to be sheep, but he wants us to be learned sheep. He wants us to be wise sheep because we're following the eternal shepherd. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we have Hebrew Israelites. We have um, Egyptologists or the Hotep folk. We have people out there that are in the new age myth mythology. And then you have some people that get into the dark web and they start searching all of these websites and come up with their own set of beliefs which are a hodgepodge mishmash of a whole bunch of different types of things and they don't go to church anywhere they don't believe anybody's wrong anybody's right they just come up with their own set of beliefs and say I'm more spiritual than I am religious but you don't know what they believe and they affirm no truth and there's a lot of folk that are out there that's why as the people of God and that's why as far as pastors and leaders we have to be able to know what we believe and why and be able to point people to the truth of the scriptures. So this Apostles' Creed is one part of that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about belief here. So here's the key question. Why should I believe anything at all? Well, when one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity. When many people suffer from a delusion, it's called religion. Mm -hmm. Get that. And that was a quote by Robert Pissrig, an American writer and philosopher, mm -hmm. probably an anti-theist or an atheist, or at least an agnostic. So, how, when, you, when you see this, or when you see certain things on Facebook, or even inside of some of our urban settings, when you see somebody with an upside down cross and said, I don't believe in this because this is what the slave masters brought to this particular nation through whip and chain, when you see that stuff, it does something to you. So, initially, when we see something like that, we kind of check out. And we ignore it, be like, oh, well, they just don't believe, they're going to hell. But... Many of us, when we see that, sometimes we're swayed by those things if we don't know what we believe and have strength in our own value system first. You could be caught, and we can be caught away or um, brought away from the faith. So why do people believe what they believe? Well, they believe what they believe through sociological or psychological or religious aspects. Sociological, such as cultural friends, parents, society, psychological, such as comfort, hope, um, identity, meaning, a peace of mind, religious church, a guru, a holy book, or even a pastor. This one is getting a, has gotten a lot of folk and a lot of problems because sometimes people, um, and this is even, um, this is very important to highlight. Um, if you have a pastor that has a good reputation for many years, sometimes people will believe the person over God. Okay. They'll believe the person over God to the point that if that person does something contrary to God and something egregious, or if that person falls from grace, their faith is shattered. Mm -hmm. And they said, I used to respect you, but now since you did this particular act, I no longer want to be a part of the church ever again. Mm -hmm. But who did you come for? Did you come for God or did you come for a man? Mm -hmm. That's very important. Even as a pastor, you man, you 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 cutting out your own constituency. No, I'm not. Because if I tell you the truth, 
and the truth will set you free, you'll be free to come back again and again because you'll learn more and more and your relationship with God will become better and better because not everybody hears these things everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So are any of these areas the right reason to believe? To some certain extent. So why should people believe in what they believe? Well, here's a philosophical approach to ascertain facts or truth and the causes of things. Something is worth believing if it is rational, rational, it makes sense, supported by evidence, and number three, the best reason for explaining gathered data. That's the way the philosophers believe something, okay? Rational. It makes sense that one plus one equals two, okay? How is that supported by evidence? Here's one item, here's another item. If I were to look at Jamari and I asked him, how many is this? How many items do I have in my hand? It would be two. So we have supported evidence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I could believe not that, it's, that the number two is valid, but that math is valid. Right. Okay, and the number three, the best reason for explaining the gathered data. So if I'm going to have three items in my hand, if I know that two makes sense, then if I add something to that, then that, that, that equals to number three. So that means that math makes sense in various different ways. So I can believe that math is accurate. You know it's accurate when it comes to those bills, right? <laughs> that cell phone bill, that, 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 that car note, those are numbers. And so they believe that numbers are accurate because it's been tried and tested over and over again. That's a philosophical aspect of it. But what happens when you don't do this? Well, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. Okay, I want to believe he's a good man because he got green eyes. <laughs> but he might be a green-eyed monster at the house. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, I'm going past that. All right, I might need to get me some green content. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing y'all. Uh-uh. No, no, not at all. C.S. Lewis says, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Okay. If you want a good person to look up, um, not everybody's interested in always looking, looking up authors or doctors or different people who specialize in, you know, Christian philosophy. C.S. Lewis, um, as a side note, was the individual that um, wrote many different books that had Christian allegory in it. You know, if you uh, remember The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or The Chronicles of Narnia, this is the man that wrote those particular books. So he was a Christian um, author and a philosopher um, in the early days of the 20th century. But this particular quote um, is something that would be supported by different people in the, Christ, in, in the Christian faith, one of them being William Lane Craig. He's a Christian philosopher. He likes to posit the existence of God by using philosophical arguments such as presuppositionalism, such as Kamler's cosmological argument, all those different types of things which are of interest for me. So if you're interested in things like that, you can always look up reasonable faith. That's one of the resources that I look at because I have to study all this stuff in order to answer y'all questions. All right. But if you're interested in stuff like that, then that's a good resource for you to have. All right. Okay. But some of y'all are cool with just the Bible. So in Colossians chapter two, <laughs> verse eight, <laughs> see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow or empty and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Jesus Christ. OK. So you should not be swayed just because somebody inboxes you with some new knowledge. Or you know that that pastor down there is really worshiping a white Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay? But we have relatives that sincerely believe that. And here's the other thing. Many of us, when we tell the relatives that that is not the case, they may still believe what they want to anyway. Mm -hmm. Because the contrary is unattractive. You mean to tell me that that Bible has some validity to it? No, 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 no. I don't want to believe that because at the core of many of us, um, when it comes to God, especially when I think back 
glory. When I when I when I think back to um, <laughs> when I think back to when I was in school, I really didn't want to have anything to do with God because I knew eventually I was going to be judged by him. Okay. You mean if I got a burner or a gun in my pocket, I can't handle this God? You mean this God is the one who can render justice beyond the grave? That God? Uh, I'd rather keep my distance from him. Okay. I'd rather just not know and do my own thing. But at our core of our existence, the very thing that we try to get away from is the same thing that will eventually draw us. Okay. All right. So here's philosophy. Philosophy, um, philosophy is defined as the love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. This is where you get all these deep brothers, okay, or deep sisters. They look like when they walk in the room, they feel like they're just floating on there. <laughs> I was Joan of Arc in my former life, where I just know about these things. Uh, you need to just do your research. Um, urban uh, folk, black folk, white folk, everybody in between. There is a way that you do research. There is a way that you find out facts and statistics. You can't just go by a picture on Facebook. This is very important because I see it all the time. You can't just go by a photo or a meme on Facebook that somebody posts there as evidence for their particular belief system. Proper research, you know that class that we like to skip? You know those book reports that those teachers try to make us do back in elementary and mm -hmm. high school that we didn't want to do mm -hmm. and we usually funked <laughs> out, but because we knew how to play sports and we knew how to you know, flirt with the teacher, we just got passed on. Some of those things are biting many in our community and in many other communities around this nation. It's biting them because we skipped those classes and we didn't learn the proper way to look up stuff. And so because we skipped those classes and didn't learn the proper way to research things, we figured the only thing we need to do is read. Only. But if you're going to do research on anything, you need to look up primary sources. In other words, what was the original source documentation for whatever you're researching in, not somebody else's opinion. Mm -hmm. If you read a book from some particular gentleman that's from 1950 and he says himself that he's the foremost authority on the Christian um, value system, then you're going to have to look at it with some level of skepticism. You didn't invent the faith. Mm -hmm. God did. God brought this knowledge to ourselves. So I need to go all the way back to the Bible for one, as the number one resource, and I need to look at people who were affected by the biblical text and what they wrote before all of the religion from the world tainted everything. I need to look at that stuff. I don't need to just look at the King James Version of the Bible and say, hey, this is what the Bible says in the King James Version, masters and slaves, so therefore the Bible endorsed slavery. No, you need to know that the King James Bible was not written in English when it first came out. God doesn't even care about English. <laughs> That's not God's language. It isn't. We don't know what language he spoke from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. English is a new thing. 1611 version of the Bible is a new thing. So how did Christians talk with one another before 1611? That's very important for you to know. Okay. So, as a nice little nugget, you need to know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. So, if you want to know what a real word means, you look up when you're in the New Testament and you look at the four Gospels, you want to find out what a hard word means, you need to look up the translation in the Greek. If you want to find out what a true word means in the Old Testament, you need to look it up in Hebrew, not English. Amen. Did you know that the word son did not even exist in the Old Testament during that moment in time? Uh, that's just a nice little tidbit. But that's important, especially when you have people out there that say, hey, uh, the Bible came from sun worship. Mm -hmm. How can that be when that word didn't even translate into Egyptian language or Medunetur back in the Old Testament time? Now, I'm not expecting everybody to know that. I have to know those things just in case you have questions in the future. The bottom line is, when you do research, you have to research the right way. Especially when you're challenged on what you believe, if that ever should happen. Or if you have kids in the back of the car, be like, Mama, why you go to church all the time? 
Well, I believe that it's necessary to go to the church because we want to have fellowship with one another. You could just keep it simple. But then if you got one of those nerdy kids that ask all them questions that sit down and they don't say anything, but they think and think and think and think and think, then you have to have, have to be able to have an intelligent conversation with that individual. Not necessarily to convert them, but at least let them know that mama knows her stuff or daddy knows his stuff or brother knows his stuff, uncle knows his stuff. All right. Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 through 10. And when it comes to this series, we're going to take this slow. So it may take me six months to get all of this done. We're going to take it one step at a time. Okay? All right. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 through 10 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. You see that? From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity guarding the paths of justice and he preserves the way of his godly ones his children then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity and every good course for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your souls once again that's proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 and 10. the main gist of that particular scripture is that all will it all knowledge and understanding comes from God. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me rephrase that. God is the source of all truth and wisdom. He is the source of all truth and wisdom. So if you want to know the bottom line of anything that you're going through in life, you should always ask God about it or read about it in his word. And if you're confused about something in the word, then you ask God, give me wisdom knowledge and understanding so that I can see where you're coming from because right now there's stuff going on at the house and you're telling me to go to your word and your word mirrors my situation but but I'm not able to put it all together that's when you ask God for wisdom wisdom is like a gift but if you ask God for wisdom he'll give it to you liberally mm -hmm. Pastor Martin how, did, how is it that you know so much stuff I was stupid in college but I had good grades every now and then and what I mean by that, it's not really like I'm insulting or downgrading myself. I'm just being truthful because when I was 22, 23, 24 years old, I made multiple bad decisions, multiple unwise decisions that had serious consequences that affect me even to this day in some aspects of my life. So once I got tired of the pain, self-inflicted gunshot wounds, <laughs> Once I got tired of my own stupidity, then I said, God, please help me with this. Matter of fact, I even asked my dad, I said, Daddy, how, do you know a way that I can um, start making good decisions? He said, well, you know, you need to just ask God. Now, he might not have known the specific scripture, but then when I did a little more digging, I heard about the scripture that says, those that ask God for wisdom, well, he will give it to them liberally. Or as much as you want. You want a whole bunch of wisdom about the situation? Here you go. Have it. So we need wisdom when it comes to raising our children. We need wisdom when it comes to dealing our, late, uh, our daily lives, how to make decisions. It keeps us out of a whole bunch of trouble. And it helps us navigate things when we get into trouble. You caught in between two men or two women. You caught in between two decisions. This one's nice. This one's nice too. Both of them want to get with me. Both of them love God. I'm caught in between two opinions. <laughs> God, give me the wisdom on which one to choose. Because whichever one you married, you stuck for the rest of your life with it. If it's a negative situation, you stuck for the rest of your life. If it's a positive situation, then you have a covenant for the rest of your life. So you need wisdom, especially when both things look like good answers. You ever been faced with a situation like that where you have looks like you got two good choices? Both of the jobs are paying $25 an hour. Both of them will allow for me to be able to pay some bills. But I want God to be able to tell me in the spirit or give me wisdom as to which one I should choose because I don't want to make $25 an hour just for one month and then I get let go because of some unforeseen thing that I'm not aware of. I want to choose the one that I can make $25 an hour for 10 years if I, if it, if it or as long as God has me there for whatever assignment because sometimes God wants to bless you but we have to be put in a place where he has us on assignment 
If he only has you on assignment for one month in a specific place making $25, then you're there for that month. You get let go. But then, oh, then you believe and say, God, I know I was here for just for a purpose. I believe my purpose has been fulfilled. Then you get another phone call. Here's another position, $30 an hour. You were obedient. You picked the right thing. Because while that job may have been only for 30 days, you got 30 days of experience that you would not have gotten at the other job. That just has you making a lot of money but not teaching you anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Y'all have me preaching a little bit. But I, I just get excited about stuff like this because you all push me to learn more, to get deeper into the word and to study more. That's why if it looks like I'm talking loud, it's because God has commissioned me to not only just teach, but teach with authority on specific things. And your authority comes when you study. Okay? All right. So the philosophical, the philosophical test for any believer or any valid belief system basically are broken down into three areas. Number one, logical consistency. Does it make sense? More than one time. Second time, empirical adequacy. Is there evidence that can be measurable? Third one, existential relevancy. In other words, it must present a consistent, non-contradictory manner, provide evidential and explanatory support, and account for the facts of experience. In other words, the scripture says, come let us reason together. And so let me just make this in just real good church talk, okay? Somebody tells you to pray. Okay. You don't really have a deep prayer life, but somebody has let you know that when you pray, as the scripture says, and all things with supplication and prayer, or pray without ceasing, what's the wisdom behind that? Well, when you pray to God and you talk to God, prayers get answered. Yes. If you don't pray, nothing gets answered. He'll have favor on you and he'll help you, but if you don't talk to the man, then you're not going to get as much out of your faith as necessary. Mm -hmm. So, when you see that your prayers start getting answered, over and over and over again throughout your life that shows that there is consistency with prayer number one number two empirical adequacy can this be measurable well not only does prayer make sense hey if I don't if, oh, I think I got that backwards in logical consistency prayer makes sense because if I don't talk to God then we don't really have a relationship with each other Okay, so that's in one particular category. So it has to make sense for me to talk to God. That's what prayer is. Mm -hmm. Category number two, empirical adequacy. That is, how many times has God answered your prayer throughout your life? If he never answered no prayer, then you could say it makes sense to not talk to him. But if grandmama's prayers are legendary in the family, especially during court dates, <laughs> And grandma's prayers are legendary. And then you figure, hey, when you go to church, you start praying too, and all these other different types of things, and your prayers start getting answered too throughout your life, then wow, this must be a real thing. Okay? That that's that's very important for, for, for us to understand. And then existential um, relevancy. Is there any explanation for this? Okay. You told me that I need to talk to God. God answers my particular prayer. Okay, I get all of that. But when it comes to existential relevancy, okay, well, how can this relate to me? Or is there an explanation for this? Well, because God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, he has the ability to be able to relate to what I ask for. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sigma Freud says, and we're coming around the mountain, and this is just part um, A of the creed. I won't be able to finish all of this tonight. But in part one of, of I believe, it, Sigma Freud says, and this is another philosopher, he said, they, or religious beliefs, are illusions. Fulfillments of the oldest, strongest, and most urgent wishes of mankind. Notice how he says, religious people like to wish a lot. We call belief an illusion when a wish Fulfillment is a prominent factor in its motivation. And in so doing, we disregard its re re relation to reality. Just as the illusion itself sets no store by verification. Long story short, 
there's a group of people in and out of the church that look at the Christian faith as wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. Okay? Yeah. All right. And then last part that I think I'm going to, um, last couple of parts that I'm going to talk about this particular night, I think I'm going to end with epistemology because when I see the eyes start getting woozy, that means it's time to stop. And I'm talking about me. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Epistemology. First of all, let's just talk with the, what's the word. The word basically means knowledge. How do you gather knowledge? Did you know that there's basically um, a couple of different types of churches that are out there? Okay. There are experience-based churches. You even have churches, in other words, and if, if you have an experience when you go to church, that means that God must be there, right? Mm -hmm. I see everybody hollering, huckabucking, speaking in tongues, rolling on the floor, sweating, hold on, let go, hold on, let go. That must mean God is there because I've had an experience. And sometimes people stay there. If pastor wants to teach about giving, there's no experience there. That must mean God was not in the building. Ichabod is all over that building. I went there, man. Y'all said that they were supposed to be jumping in here. It wasn't jumping today because he was talking about giving or about sin. Mm -hmm. But God is just as holy on the day that everybody is not excited as he is when everybody is excited. He's consistent. We are not. That's experience based. Then there is epistemologically based churches that are all about knowledge and study every Sunday feels like a lecture at a um, Ivy League college valid truthful you can have legitimate experiences from God that's why we have charismatic churches but then you have charismatic that's K-E-R Y-G-M-A charismatic churches in other words it's just focus on the word today class we will be talking about Plenary substitution or the righteousness of God. <laughs> the righteousness of God, as it says from out of the Gospels, is when there is an exchange from your life for another. Turn with me and let's read these 15 to 25 verses of scripture <laughs> in concert with each other. Ready? Read. Da 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 da. Now, on paper, it's all right. Mm -hmm. The knowledge is accurate, but if you just do that and you're boring, you still yeah. gonna not be. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the key key areas, and then you have an evidential. You know, in other words, you have to show me something. Um, so, oh, in other words, show me what you got, or show me what you're working with. Type of church. In other words, there's miracle signs and waters every single Sunday, but. Those type of churches actually do a disservice because when you look at the biblical text, there's not miracle signs and wonders that happen in every day. Sometimes there's, they happen hundreds and even thousands of years apart from each other. They still happen, but not as often as we like to say that they happen. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about these fake prophets that's out here another time. All right, they speaking in fake tongues. They got you on Facebook Live. No church nowhere. But you sending them seeds one after another, saying, yes, God, bless God, and all this other fake stuff that's out there. I think I need to pull the Old Testament out. Mm -hmm. all right. So the branch of philosophy that investigates, or epistemology is the branch of philosophy that investigates the nature and origin of another. In other words, how do we know what we know? How did you, how do you know that there's even a God in the first place? Where did that come from? How did you even know that you're even human? Who told you that? <laughs> Somebody said that you were human because you read it inside a biology book. But where did the source of that information come from? Well, we know that God knew exactly what it is because it's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And on the sixth day, he created man. Mm -hmm. So you know that you are a man or a woman by looking at the scriptures. Biology caught up to that. Biology, in many instances, affirms exactly what the Bible talks about. Mm -hmm. It may not go over every methodology, but the base truth of it, they both correspond with each other. So epistemology basically means think critically, 
you examine, mm -hmm. like the Berean Christians, is what Pastor Martin's saying legitimate or not? Is this church legitimate or not? Are they fake or not? Because we know that we don't like fake folk, right? Mm -hmm. We don't like two-faced folk. I like that's like two-faced. <laughs> We don't like phony people. So if you don't like phony people, then you should also not like phony knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because how does a phony person make you feel? It makes you feel some kind of way mm -hmm. to know that one a homegirl was 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 one way or acting one way towards you while y'all in between the lockers when Charles came around and you said that you like Charles and she said, nah, he ain't he ugly. But then <laughs> Two days later, you find out to the grapevine that she was over at Charles' house. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be looking at her like, mm -hmm. you two-faced it. You knew that I liked him, but yet you're going to holler at him? Okay. So, you got to examine certain particular things. So, just like we don't like phony people, we don't need to have phony mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, we have to think critically. You got to examine stuff. Yeah. You got to think clearly. Yeah. Clarification. Yeah. All right. I know that he ain't no good for me. I know that she ain't no good for me, mm. but I don't need to make a decision while I'm tired, upset, or hungry, mm -hmm. or while he's playing key sweat through the phone or through the cell phone as I'm trying to discern whether or not I want to cut him or her off. Mm -hmm. So I need clarity. Mm -hmm. I need to, goodbye, I'm just going to get some quiet time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me get alone by myself and let me see if I can make sense of what you just said to me. And if I'm going to get on this rodeo again, like genuine. <laughs> no, this is where the carousel stops. Because God has spoken to me. I see this. I, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I, 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 God has moved all the obstacles out of my way. There's a, that sound is going to be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. Now, that's a nice little song. But the truth of the matter is, is that you make better decisions when things are clear. And sometimes you can't always make a decision during the storm. Sometimes you just need to be still and know that he is God. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why sometimes we got to sit in our house while the hurricane passes. Mm -hmm. You can't go out there and talk about, I'm going to go through the grocery store. No, everything's <laughs> shut down. Mm -hmm. You don't need to make a decision right now. The decision is to do nothing. <laughs> right. So if we understand that with the weather that's on the outside, mm -hmm. what happens when we have conflicting opinions and storms on the inside? Sometimes we just don't need to do anything. That's wisdom, an example of wisdom, okay? Think correctly, that's argumentation. In other words, you're wrong, I'm right. The truth will come up to the surface. If you're wrong about something, I have to have enough courage to correct you, if I love you. No, you should not have this specific attitude as a man when it, when it comes to taking care of your family or providing. No, you can't have that. So let me give you the right information. No, sister, you can't have the wrong information as far as your role inside of the household or your role inside of the church as far as service. Yes, you do need to be on time. Yes, if you're going to be a leader in the church, for all the folk that's watching right now, if you're a leader inside of the church, you need to fast and you need to pray or else you won't have any power and anointing to execute what you're trying to do on stage or in the pews. Mm -hmm. Y'all can tell I've been fasting, right? <laughs> Amen. Think comprehensively. This is systemization. In other words, what is the big picture of all of this? All right, and I think that's where um, I'm going to wrap up. When you look at things backing up um, in a big picture, that big picture or this whole form is all summarized in Matthew 22, verse 37, which says, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul." all of your strength. It says your mind on the slide, but mind is interchangeable with the word soul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I think we missed that. When you hear in the scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that's one part. All your soul, that's another part. All your strength, you know what that means? Love God with everything in you. Love God with all that you have. Love God in a comprehensive manner. 
comprehensive means everything all together. Mm. And since we're a tripartite being, that means we're loving God with everything that we've got. Mm -hmm. All that I am, all that I'm not. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what comprehensive means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so finally, as we close tonight, epistemology, once again, is the branch of philosophy that investigates the nature and origin of knowledge. So we have our minds, maybe knowing or ignorant. We also have propositions. They may be true or false. Let me break that down a little bit. Either you know something or you don't. I'm ignorant to Spanish. I don't know it. So therefore, I can't speak on it. If I'm ignorant, and if you understand that example, then you should also be able to understand an example such as, I'm ignorant to where, to the processes that Jamar has at his job as well as to your job. I'm ignorant as it relates to your household. I don't know what goes on there. So if I want to be educated, I can't just say, hey, I know what's going on at Sister Girl's job. Pay me. No. I don't work there. I do not qualify. I can't speak on those particular things because I don't have all the facts. In other words, that's the moment when you say, mind your own business. You can't speak on this particular situation because you're ignorant to the facts at hand. Mm -hmm. Propositions. It may be true, it may be false. Well, we both work together. <laughs> you said you took out the trash. I said that you didn't. Who's lying? Well, it's one, your word against mine. But the boss man put in some cameras. Let's go to the tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll find out who Ever is making the right proposition. Mm -hmm. And then finally, objects. They may be real or imaginary. I always go back to this old song called, called My Mind is Playing Tricks on Me by the Ghetto Boys. Long, long, old, old song, but it's still one of the uh, coolest songs out there. All right, the clean version. Okay. In that particular song, My Mind is Playing Tricks on Me, at the very end, um, Bushwick Bill is pounding the pavement. He was pounding the pavement, but in the song or in the rap song, it's basically saying that he thought that that was actually a person or some type of figure, some type of demonic spirit. That's how I saw it. But he thought his mind was playing tricks on him. He thought he was actually fighting against somebody who was coming against him. He stood about six or seven feet. The same guy that I see in my sleep. And so he thought that that was real in his mind. It may have now now the song doesn't go into um, why they were having those thoughts, but I'm I I because I have some insight into that. It might have been because of the pressure of the environment. You gonna have uh, tricks going through your mind, or your mind is gonna play tricks on you if you if you got a kilo up under the bed and you got robbed a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. or somebody that just got violated around mm -hmm. the corner so you're going to have a sense of anxiety mm -hmm. and you're going to be paranoid mm -hmm. okay so if somebody says that they got a bounty on your head you're going to be looking around mm -hmm. and all these different types of things and so at the end of the story he's pounding the ground as if it's the actual herd he said drop them fifth ward beams on them but he said more I swung the more blood food then he disappeared and then the boys disappeared too and then he started looking at his hands, and his hands were bloody from punching on the concrete. His mind was playing tricks on him. Mm -hmm. He thought the object was real, but it was actually imaginary. Mm -hmm. So our minds can play tricks on us. That's why we need wisdom to understand what is real from what is not real. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can want things to be real so bad until we make them a reality in our own minds, mm -hmm. but then we end up failing and falling flat. So I already gave those particular examples. In this particular example, let's talk about unicorns. Unicorns are imaginary objects, therefore the proposition, unicorns do not exist, is true. And when a mind ascends to this proposition, the person knows it to be true and has acquired knowledge. Okay. Erasers exist. All right, that's cool. This is an eraser. From this point forward, you now have knowledge of erasers because the information or the 
uh, evidence has presented itself to you for you to see. Now, when it comes to God, he's invisible. But evidence is not by what we see. It's by faith. And our spirit lets us know that things are real or not. Real or imaginary. Okay? All right. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We honor you and we bless you. We thank you for this wonderful teaching, Lord God. I pray that um, there was something that um, each and every individual under the sound of my voice was able to get from out of this particular session, Lord God. I pray that um, you may be glorified in everything that we do as a ministry and even myself, Lord God. I also pray for those that are going through our 21-day fast as a corporate body. Let them have strength and let them have um, wisdom to be able to finish it to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Are there any questions at all? Are there any questions? Y'all look good? That's wonderful because that means I wore your brains out. All right. <laughs> God bless you. God keep you. This is our prayer. Next week we'll go into part two of I Believe, and that will be our conclusion for this particular sub series. Be blessed. <laughs>